Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of the Understanding Folk and Cultural Tradition Workshop, a project sponsored by Florida Humanities Greater Group Program. And to those who attend this session yesterday, welcome back. I am Dr. Lan Lan Kuang, Associate Professor in the Department of Philosophy at UCF, also the Director of the Humanities and Cultural Studies Program. Uh, I am the project director of this workshop. We had an amazing run of sessions on day one yesterday, starting with the opening introduction by Dr. Peggy Bolger, who served as director of the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress, and the new Florida folklorist, Dr. Dominic Tataglia. The two featured speakers we have for yesterday's program Dr. Annette Form, Chair of the Florida Folklife Council um, and past president of the International Committee of Museum of Ethnography, and Dr. O Osiris Gomez, who is an expert on indigenous poetry, each gave a wonderful presentation. Our morning session on day one each ended with a highly engaging Q&A discussion session after two student presentations. And now I will let my colleagues, Dr. Natalie Undergood, uh, Underberg Good, Vice President of the Florida Folklore Society, and Dr. Dominic Tataglia, Florida's new state folklorist, start day two's introduction. Natalie. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm excited to be here and to learn more from this. Um, this uh, the panelists today. I think that Dr. Tartaglia is going to start us off and um, that I'm going to come in and um, add some more thoughts and then he'll wrap up this introduction. So Dr. Tartaglia. Are you there? Are you kidding me? I can hear you now. We can hear you, you can now. You can hear me? Okay, I, I got logged uh, off. I think I'm back. There we go. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. So, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Natalie. And uh, I'm very excited to be here today. Uh, Natalie is going to talk to you about uh, people and groups she has uh, worked with who are new to Florida in some way. Uh, but I certainly count uh, as someone who is new to Florida as the brand new uh, safe folklorist. So I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about myself, talk about the work I do as a way to introduce myself as I am uh, Florida's newest uh, transplant in the uh, folklore and folk arts uh, space. So everyone can see my uh, PowerPoint okay? All right. So, uh, like uh, everyone keeps saying, my name is Dr. Dominic Tartaglia, but if that's too syllabically complicated, well, you can just call me Dom. And I might be the newest person to Florida on this Zoom call. And if anyone is newer than me, uh, A, I'm proud of you for getting involved in the Florida Folklore Society so quickly, and B, I'm honored to be exploring Florida uh, if, at the same time as you. But as the newest addition to Florida and uh, the Folklife Program in Tallahassee, I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself to contextualize things. Um, so just generally biographical information, I was, I was born in New Jersey, but I was raised in Ohio. Uh, and between those states, that means that most of my family has lived in Florida my entire life. My my poppy Tartaglia lived in Fort Lauderdale. My uh, uh, uncle Tony lives in Fort Myers. And my mom and stepdad currently reside in Naples. There's a, a shot of my family uh, from, from their wedding about ooh, 10 years ago. After uh, high school, I went to college at the University of Cincinnati, originally a philosophy major. I took one anthropology class and I was hooked. And I loved my time in the city of Cincinnati. And before I even had a word for it, I was enamored by the distinct folkways of one of America's great cities, uh, such as the breakfast mystery meat staple Geta, uh, Cincinnati Chili, the great, <laughs> the great discussion point, and what will go on to be one of my field sites, Oktoberfest. 
That's the running of the wiener dogs there. Uh, when I was in college, I picked classics as a second major. I already knew too much Latin from Catholic school. I thought this would be an archaeology, or uh, this would help me be an archaeologist. And the field of archaeology was the closest I'd come to the synthesis of all my interests from undergrad. A highlight uh, was the you see here the summer I spent at field school in Shawnee Lookout State Park, where we found a settlement built by woodland people from over a thousand years ago and i uh, that was very gratifying and i liked that a lot but there was uh, there was an emptiness that i always felt in the heart of archaeology that we'd always be assuming uh, about the art people left behind and we'd never be able to talk to anyone about what they intended so i uh, that that desire to talk to someone uh, on the on the like other side of the art i found uh, led me more towards cultural anthropology and myth between my two majors and not realizing there was a field where I could do both of those in such a great way. I eventually found works by folklorists such like Alan Dundas and Bill Hansen and ended up at Indiana. I had an interest uh, in myth, like I said, when I got to grad school. And even though I found other topics to research, I never stopped asking the big questions that being a myth scholar teaches you, like the, the so what questions of existence. And while myth is good at answering these on like the cosmological scale of the universe, foodways, my main topic I study, pertains to another kind of existence. And that is an existence predicated on eating. Everyone eats or they die, but to reflect on the questions of why we pick what we eat, what it's made of, and specifically for my work, for my work, how we can answer fundamental questions about ourselves, either personal or societal and existential. That that's why I wanted to become a folklorist in the first place, and I found myself studying those uh, those big questions through foodways, and and. Uh, Consequently, that's how I, uh, these big existential questions about ourselves are how I ended up writing a dissertation about hot dog eating contests in the United States. And if that sounds like a non sequitur of unexamined, it really does come from the same intellectual strain of questions that are always in my heart. So let's talk about the fieldwork I did for that. Uh, my dissertation was about how hot dog eating contests at American festivals re reinforce the group identity in which the festivals communicate. And I studied Three festivals, I'm going to go over them through the course of my fieldwork project. Uh, chapter one was a general introduction, both about the hot dog uh, itself and the history of eating contests, both overlap uh, very prominently in the 1910s in Coney Island. I talk about the early eating contests and now, the now highly professionalized one ones that are run out of major league eating, known best for the Nathan's famous 4th of July International Hot Dog Eating Contest. Uh, it's Nathan Handwerker there, the, the, the aforementioned famous one, uh, who was of the generation of Jewish immigrants in New York City, who brought sausages to lunch counters and created the, the hot dog as we know it. For chapter two, I was at the 100th annual Nathan's Famous. There I contextualized the history and evolution of competitive eating with the Independence Day Street Fair, on the ground every year. Also mentioned were the dramatis personae of the competitive eaters the master and the master of ceremonies, George Shea. In true Coney Island pitchman style, George invented a tradition of kayfabe and storylines for the contest and turned it into a festival about American exceptionalism. Uh, the next chapter, like I mentioned earlier, was about Cincinnati Oktoberfest and the World Bratwurst Eating Competition. It's the largest Oktoberfest in the States, and you would have a field of six invited pros and six local eaters who duke it out over the local favorite Gleer's Bratwursts. And I explained the story of Cincinnati, but I had to explain the history of Germans in Cincinnati going back to the 1840s and immigration to Ohio to the, the spot they all settled, a bend in the canal that the locals named Over the Rhine, and uh, a whole history of immigrants in Ohio leading up to a push to restore historical buildings in the late aughts that, that led to a resurgence of German heritage in the city, uh, which is articulated the best for me through this giant festival of German identity and Bratwurst. The one that's closest to my heart is the Labor Day uh, Coney Eating Contest in downtown Detroit, uh, which on paper looks just like a you know day of hot dogs with police and firefighters. This this uh, festival was actually the mechanism by which many police and fire families stayed afloat in the recession. It's the, the story 
of how finance capital let Detroit down in the recession, how a scandal at the governor's mansion blew the lid on machine politics and corruption, and how a city went so broke they had to draw from the pensions of their city employees. But an all-star team of Detroit locals, including the scion of a hot dog eating dynasty and a Pulitzer Prize winner, created an all-day chili dog eating fundraiser, which from 2010 to 2018 was the single biggest funder of the police and fire uh, pensions. This is uh, my favorite photo from my fieldwork, and this was like an improvised first to five uh, chili dog eating sprint, or conies as they call them in Detroit. Completely improvised. There was a bucket on the table for tips. People were throwing uh, uh, checks in there. There were old rivalries, uh, long dormant being uh, that were resurged over this. And it was, it was like the, as someone who grew up right outside of Michigan, it's one of the most Michigan things that's ever happened. But I guess that's kind of the thesis of my study. Anything that happens at a festival uh, who sponsors this, uh, these kind of eating contests as deliberate cultural performances, it is a good representation of the culture groups at the, the festival. Um, and this had to do with my conclusion too, but. The examination of the transgressive nature of overeating uh, in public, especially the deliberate like lewdness and disrespectfulness of it all. And all, all of these notions chanting are leading to people chanting USA for a man eating 70 hot dogs in 10 minutes. After grad school, I graduated in 2019, uh, kind of recently. I got a job at the War Museum of Wildfall Arts, Salisbury University, Salisbury, Maryland, at the, as the curator and folklorist. Um, uh, as compared to like the ephemeral nature of food as material culture, uh, these the hunting decoys and bird sculptures are made to last beyond their function in the water. And I presided over this just amazing collection of bird art. Uh, I curated an exhibit called 50 Years of Excellence, where we displayed 26 birds from 50 years of the Ward Museum's uh, wildfowl carving championship. And it was uh, the exhibit was a promotion for the 50th contest, which was slated to run April 26, 2020. Hey, was anything else happening in the world? April of 2020 or so. So obviously, the pandemic was pretty precarious for all museums, and this was no different. Uh, the exhibit that replaced the 50 Years of Excellence exhibit some six months after it was slated to open, but we finally got it open, was called Storytelling with Purpose, and it was... Uh, a, a exhibit about the documentary quilts of Maryland Traditions Heritage Award winner, Dr. Joan M. E. Gaither. Um, we delayed it six months, but we finally got her 15 foot biographical quilt panels all over the gallery. Highlights included uh, this monumental piece called Is History Repeating Itself? and a made for exhibit piece. Uh, made from quilters uh, on the east, uh, eastern shore of Maryland called the Lower Eastern Shore Community Quilt. Uh, also, as the folklorist part of my job, it entailed running Lower Shore Traditions, a Maryland Traditions partner. Basically, I was the folklorist for the Atlantic Coast of Maryland. And uh, I had some opportunities to, to do some pretty cool work uh, during the pandemic even. Um, the uh, National Council for Traditional Arts and NPR came to me during... Uh, the lead up to the 2020 Digital National Folk Festival and have me produce documentary shorts, which stood in for like the folk life area of the festival that year. Uh, I got to work with so many people and groups in the series called Just Speak Traditions Today, where I looked at uh, the folklore across Maryland, Delaware, and Virginia. Um, this is one of my just favorite uh, success stories here about the, uh, the Filipino Festival in Salisbury, Maryland. I first uh, contacted uh, Mary Anita, who's in the middle with the glasses there, uh, to <laughs> talk to her about the Filipino community in, oh, pardon me, Filipino community in Maryland in about, uh, we were supposed to talk, have coffee in April of 2020. We were so naive that, but um, I turned that in, I interviewed her, turned that, got some old uh, photos from the festival, turned that into a uh, four minute short. And the NCTA loved it so much that they invited uh, the people who put on this Filipino festival to perform at the National Folk Festival. And I really felt like I, I was part of something there. It was, I, was, I was so proud to see these people. Um, but that being said, uh, I, was, I was at the Folk Festival that year uh, as an employee. I was, I was not at the museum because, uh, again, COVID. 
uh, cause so many problems with the uh, budgets, especially for museums and that, that sort of thing. And it was about that time that I decided uh, I was going to start a new project. So I am a, a part of Wise Folk Productions LLC, a group of folklorists and communities professionals who provide services in digital content creation and production, marketing and outreach, and digital archiving and processing to inquiring nonprofit and public uh, education focused organizations. Um, we mainly do videos and live streams uh, where we interview, interview folklorists or folk artists or people who work somewhere in culture. You might uh, recognize us from the hybrid stream of the American Folklore Society where we streamed uh, the conference. Um, and you, or you might have also seen us when we were interviewing folklorists uh, after hours at the conference, which was a, a, a just a lot of fun. And that the 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 streams really took off in in 2020 it was i was able to make it like a, a sort of self-employed part-time job and it came up in my interview for the florida state folklorist position they they had seen my streams they had seen that i knew how to like uh, edit and use editing and streaming software it was on it was in the car with my computer disassembled and packed on my way to harrisburg to go to afs that i got the call uh to uh, uh, there, I accepted the position as the Florida State Folklore. So the Florida Folklife Program is the longest continually running state folklife program in the U.S. Uh, the folklorists who have come through uh, the folklife program and the Florida Folk Festival are kind of a who's who of public of the public sector folklore in the United States. Uh, we've also worked with seven artists who would go on to become NEA Heritage Fellows, the highest uh, honor for folk artists in the nation. On the state level, the Florida Folklife Program Awards, the Heritage Awards, and the Apprenticeship Grants, the Heritage Awards are for individual achievement in folk or traditional arts. And the uh, Apprenticeship Program are a great opportunity for a master artist who wants to take on the student, uh, take on a student, and that kind of program is a lifeblood of many folk arts programs in the states. And like I mentioned earlier, uh, the Folklorist also curates the Florida Folk Festival. We're back in person this year in White Springs Memorial Day weekend. Um, and I'm also going to, I've been working with the uh, ethnomusicology at Florida State to have volunteers uh, from the, the doctoral program in ethnomusicology there. Um, it should be mentioned that one of the performers at the festival is also one of the apprenticeship grant winners, who is Dr. Panayotis League at FSU, who has been uh, essential for my uh, new transition into this role. And currently, I'm at work on the 2022 Folklife Survey. Uh, every year is themed, and the theme this year are fire traditions in the state of Florida. This is Leslie Tharp, one of the blacksmiths uh, that I was working with. Um, and I can't wait to see where the fieldwork survey is going to bring me, where the festival is going to bring me, and you know what else I'm going to learn about the new state that I call home. Basically, that's my story. My family has long roots that always seem to lead to Florida. My graduate school career was always going to lead me to this kind of work with festivals and, and public folklore. And even though COVID very much affected my postgraduate plans, um, I've proved that I can be inventive, and I want to channel all of these into my tenure as Florida State Folklorist. Thank you very much, everyone, and I'll uh, let Natalie take over. Okay, thank you. I'm going to um, share my screen, uh, which hopefully I can do. It looks like I can. Um, it looks like we have about nine minutes left, so I'm going to... Um, rather briefly <laughs> show this um, presentation. So to tell you just a little bit about myself at, at the beginning, um, like Dr. Tartaglia and uh, Dr. Kwong, I received my PhD in, in folklore uh, from Indiana University. And my background before that was actually a cultural anthropology um, at UC Berkeley, which is where I met Alan Dundas. And that's really what got me excited about folklore. Um, and so when Dr. Tartaglia and I were talking about sort of what we wanted to say in this introduction, one of the themes that came to us was really this idea that the whole world is in Florida. Um, and so everyone has brought traditions with them and traditions change when they come. And so to illustrate that, I have three uh, brief examples that, that I found over the years that I think really illustrate this powerfully. So uh, the first one actually comes from uh, Mr. Amaury Diaz. 
who um, emigrated from, from Puerto Rico to the United States. And, and I should point out Puerto Ricans obviously are US citizens. So he came from the island to the mainland um, originally like in the 1950s and then he came back um, to settle around 1980, which is really when this community, the Puerto Rican community in Central Florida really started uh, to grow in earnest. And I should point out this particular video was produced as part of uh, Florida Humanities Council a grant that focused on the development of the Puerto Rican community um, in Central Florida. And so when Mr. There, Mr. Diaz came here and settled to stay in 1979, 19, um, 1980, like many people um, in this community, he found it difficult to find a job. And so one of the things that was reiterated in a number of the oral histories that were collected as part of this project was uh, uh, Hispanics, especially Puerto Ricans, being told, you know, you're overqualified, right? We can't, uh, we can't pay you what, what uh, you should get, so we're not going to hire you. Um, and so finding a job was really, really difficult. And but what Mr. Diaz did is he took his passion for um, for advertising, for getting people excited about events, and his background, his memories of growing up on the island and of the St. John's uh, Day tradition. So St. John is a saint who is said to have, you know, baptized Jesus Christ, and so he's associated with water, right? So he tells about growing up in, um, in, in the area of San Juan at midnight on St. John's Day, everyone would, you know, jump backwards into the water. It was, it, it was a whole day of celebration, right? People would go to the nearest beach, you'd have bonfires and, and, and so on. And so he took his kind of passion for that and, and the job he was able to find at the area's only um, uh, Hispanic, Latino Hispanic um, radio station at the time called La Magica. And he said, look, there's this great celebration I should tell you about. I can get a lot of people at your park. So here he is, he's on iDrive. So if you're in Orlando, you know, International Drive is a really big um, kind of tourist area. And he goes past this park. This is such a Central Florida uh, experience, right? He walks past this park, he sees wet and wild, right? A water park. So here we are in the middle of Florida, like an hour, an hour and a half from any water uh, body. And he goes to the park and he says, look, I can get a bunch of people to come to this event. Well, Wet and Wild tells him, sure, we like your idea. We're going to approve it, but you have to guarantee you're going to bring 600 people to, um, to Wet and Wild or you're going to owe us $10,000. And he says, well, you take chances in life. And he, he took his knowledge and his expertise in, in advertising, right, and getting people excited about the radio station. He hyped this event he said at that event, instead of 600 people, he had 1,200 people. And then Wet n Wild wanted him to do it the next year and went from 1,200 people to 3,000 people. So um, that's a really powerful example of, of how a tradition was transplanted and brought with um, the individuals who practice folk traditions to Central Florida and really adapted. Um, and it really came out of um, a, a difficulty, right? A challenge, um, but it's... Uh, became a really treasured um, celebration. Um, I'll just wrap up with a couple other quick examples. I do want to give um, uh, Dr. Chartagli a couple minutes at the end to, to, to wrap up and also Dr. Um, Dr. Kwong. But the second example actually comes from the Peruvian community in Central Florida, which has a different history. So every community has a different history of moving here and the waves of immigration. Um, so there, the, the Peruvian population in Central Florida um, is much smaller than in Miami, for example. I think Miami has like um, maybe the third largest population of Peruvians. But overall, the latest information I was able to find is that there are, you know, um, like 20 percent of all Peruvians in the U.S. live in Florida. So, you know, it, it's definitely a large community here. And one of the traditions that I was able to kind of see the, the rebirth of uh, was a Lord of Miracles procession. And, and this uh, traditionally in Lima has, you know, it could have 100,000 people uh, walking through the streets, bringing this particular image, this, this sacred image, which is said to have emerged from a, a miraculous, um, uh, an earthquake in the 17th century in, in Lima. It's a really important um, symbol. Uh, particularly for the Black Peruvian population. 
And, and so Kirsten Paragard is, a, is an anthropologist who studied this phenomenon and kind of how this tradition has uh, emerged and reemerged in the diaspora. And one of the things that he's found is that, you know, when people bring this tradition to new locations, um, they kind of um, bring that that procession out into the community in a way that kind of uh, mirrors uh, a, an, act, an act of taking up space in that community, making a mark that we're here in this community. So I was able to see kind of the birth of this in, in Kissimmee at a parish. And you can see, for example, an ex photo up here at the top um, and the, the, um, the way that the Brotherhood um, dresses. So when this Brotherhood, you know, came to the parish in Kissimmee and said, look, can we have this tradition? You know, they had to um, commission the creation of this painting, an exact replica. And then 10,000 people, we have maybe 100 or 200, but um, we have still the Brotherhood, the, uh, the men in, in purple with the white, the white um, ropes, the women, which are traditionally um, known as ahumadoras, they're the women who carry the incense burners. And one of the innovations that occurred in Central Florida is that partway through the event, the um, organizers of the Brotherhood, which is traditionally a very kind of male experience, put down the float and they invited all of the um, women in the, in the crowd, right, the lay parishioners to pick up the float and carry it for a time. Um, and according to Dr. Paragard, like he had never heard of that before. So that was an innovation um, here in the Central Florida context. So just to wrap up, um, you know, it, this is a fascinating place to study folklore. And I think folklorists have an important role really in showing the cultural diversity of the state and ensuring that we respect it. So thank you for having me. I'm really looking forward to the um, events today. And let me pass it back to Dr. Kwong, who's done a wonderful job uh, with this event um, to lead us into the next session. Thank you so much, here. Natalie. Yes, yeah, that's fine. You can leave the slides there. Thank you, Natalie, very much, and, and Dr. Tataglia, for both for sharing your vision on building stronger uh, communities and inform citizens by um, engaging Floridians in the heritage, tradition, and stories of our state, right, and its place in the world. The state of Florida has had an increasingly diverse community in the recent year. Um, for those of you who weren't here yesterday, for instance, the University of Central Florida, where uh, Dr. Under Underberger and I both work at, um, which is a metropolitan research university located in Orlando, is one of the uh, which is one of the most visited and vibrant cities in the world and UCF is well recognized for its outstanding commitment to diversity and inclusion um, as an Hispanic serving institute our university set records with nearly 50 percent of students are minorities last year in 2021 so to quote our president UCF president Dr. Carwright diversity and inclusion uh, inclusivity are essential to our excellence and our focus remains on helping all of our students realize their potential. Last year, based on a student interest survey result, two new cultural study courses focusing on folk and cultural representations were approved by the state and added to our humanities and cultural studies program at UCF. And uh, during the four sessions today, after each feature speaker's presentation, our students, the new and emerging generations of young scholars, will share their own stories and uh, research project in the Zoom sessions. So please join us uh, in all sessions after the uh, four feature speakers talk and support our students. I would like to thank the Florida Humanities Council for creating the Greater Good Humanities in Academic program, which provides university educators like myself the opportunity to further the public's interest beyond the UCF campus and form dialogue connecting the academia and diverse community. And perhaps more so than ever, it is critical for us to rediscover our cultural roots and tradition as powerful factors that shapes our understanding of the humanities. So this two-day workshop aims to introduce folk and cultural traditions as key sites in shaping the public's perceptions of race, ethnicity, 
civic rights, democracy, and environmental issues. Starting with our first featured speaker for the program on day two at we are slightly behind, but we will start in a minute at 10 o'clock, Dr. Emily Wilcox, um, Chair of the Department of Modern Language and Literature and Program Director of Chinese Study at William and Mary. She is the 2021 Wilson China Fellow, Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, Washington, DC. She is the new 20 to 23, uh, Public Intellectual Program Fellow, National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. She is also a center associate, Center for Chinese Study at the University of Michigan. Dr. Wilcox is the author of Revolutionary Bodies, Chinese Dance and Socialist Legacy, University of California Press, 2018 and the co-editor of Corporal Politics, Dancing East Asia, University of Michigan Press, 2020, and many, many other scholarly works. Emily and I first met during our football year in China, I believe, um, and the rest is history, right? We have remained close colleagues since, uh, since then. So it's my great pleasure to invite Emily to our workshop today. So I will turn the mic to Emily. Thank you so much, Lan Lan. It's great to see you. And I really appreciate um, the invitation to today's event. It was great to see all the connections because I actually grew up in Michigan and I have never been to the hot dog eating contest uh, that Dom was talking about, but my dad did um, work in Detroit. And so it was just really interesting to hear about the role of folklore and supporting the redevelopment projects in Detroit. And then also I got my PhD from the anthropology department at Berkeley as well. Um, the same um, building, I guess, at least department where Natalie um, was. So it's great to have all these connections. So I'm gonna be talking today about building a contemporary folklore archive, creating the Chinese dance collection at the University of Michigan. And I wanna emphasize that what I'm presenting today is a collaborative project between myself and Dr. Liang Yu Fu, who you can see here and with me in the picture. And she is has been a um, central part of the project from the beginning. So we sometimes present on it, but I just wanna make it clear that this is a collaborative initiative. I had been collecting materials on Chinese dance for about eight years before I came to Michigan. I had a big collection of materials that I was using in part in my own research, but I also knew that a lot of it I wouldn't really have time to write about. And it just so happened that Liang Yu as a librarian had the idea that the library would want to maybe create a collection on Chinese dance. And so one day in the fall of 2013, she approached me with this idea, would I be interested in creating a new special collection? And I thought it was like a dream come true as a scholar to be able to have resources to not only collect collect new materials, but to preserve them and make them available for other people. Our Asia Library now holds the largest collection on Chinese dance in North America. We now can share these materials with users and researchers from around the world through the digital platform and through the exhibition and uh, through many other ways. The genre of modern Chinese dance that started in the 1940s, now it's become the most popular dance style in China. I'm an anthropologist by training. I decided that I wanted to study the world of Chinese dance. And so I actually um, went to the Beijing Dance Academy. I studied there for a year and a half with a lot of the original creators of Chinese dance. So some of my teachers were actually in their 70s and had actually lived through the early stages of Chinese dance history. Dance is very much embedded in everyday life in China, but actually the research on Chinese dance um, is an emergent field of study. I was collecting oral histories from some of the most famous dancers in Chinese dance history who are now in their 80s and 90s. I found that they had personal photo collections in their homes that they would show me and walk through and explain the stories behind them, scanning each photo and documenting their memories and also getting the information. So who is that person? Where was this dance taking place? When did this happen? 
we developed this uh, collection not only to uh, benefit the U of M uh, faculty and students, but also uh, hope to bring more scholars to use our materials. I think that dance is a way to sort of allow people who maybe live in the United States who don't have a lot of experience with Chinese culture to be able to enter into Chinese culture in a way that is not necessarily through politics or economics, which is what we often hear about in the news. Um, okay, so that was a promotional video that we created for the collection in 2017 when we also presented an exhibit, which I'll talk about a little bit later to, in the presentation today. But I want to start with where this collection began, because I think it's a, um, a good example of the types of collaborative work that scholars can do together with librarians and other institutional um, collection creators. So um, Liang Yu and I both started as faculty members at the University of Michigan in the same year in 2013. Um, I was an assistant professor in the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures and Liang Yu was the Chinese studies librarian. And she asked me out to lunch one day and said she you know, just wanted to get to know each other better and that she had an idea she wanted to talk about. And so at that lunch, she pitched this idea of creating a collection on the basis of the research that I had been doing, which was on um, dance in China in the 20th century. And I think this is related to folklore because um, as you saw in the promotional video, much of the concert dance work that's happening in China today and that um, originated in the mid 20th century is directly connected to folk dance and is a kind of um, modern, um, development on folk dance practices that involves a lot of interconnections and research with folklore. And so when uh, Liang Yu pitched this idea, it was something I had never thought of. And it was really exciting to think about sort of creating a bigger legacy that would even go beyond my own research. So by creating a collection, we would actually create a place that other scholars could come to and could access um, research materials in order to grow the field of Chinese dance. And so that's where this um, began in 2013. So the goals that we had in mind and that emerged over time included um, building the collection based on original research, which so it was kind of a collection that grew out of my own research topic, um, developing a unique collection. So Liang Yu had looked at the special collections related to Chinese performing arts and other Chinese studies materials around the country. And part of the reason she wanted to do this was that there, there were no collections focused on dance in China. And so this was a way to distinguish um, the University of Michigan Asia Library from other library collections. Um, the idea of faculty librarian collaboration was something that she put forward that um, ended up becoming one of the most exciting parts of this project for me personally. Um, attracting scholars to the library, documenting an ephemeral art form um, such as dance, and stimulating new research as well as promoting the field of Chinese dance studies, um, and then sort of more broadly to educate and inspire people to become more interested in Chinese performance culture. So, one thing that I think is um, useful to think about is all of the different parts of the process that go into a collection like this. So we started out with sort of brainstorming and visioning. What do we want to do? What could we do? What would work? And you know, in a dream world, what would we want to do, right? Then we had to fundraise. So we, both Liang Yu and I, fundraised for this project um, through different me me mechanisms. So the Center for Chinese Studies, the library system, um, as well as the, um, uh, Institute for Gender Studies, um, the ACLS, there was a wide range of funding um, bodies that ended up supporting this project in different ways, whether through my research or through the collection side. Um, building a team, so we had to hire and train uh, multiple graduate students who helped with different aspects of the project, as well as postdoctoral fellows. Um, actually recruiting, um, donors for the collection from China was a huge part of the process and also researching to make sure that these were people who could um, make meaningful contributions to the collection and also could be representative of a wide range of diverse perspectives on the topic of Chinese dance. Um, multiple trips to China to dancers homes to dance libraries to dance um, companies to um, network connect with people and then physically scan or purchase or collect um, the different materials for the collection. 
Um, permissions and copyright was a whole area, of course, that we worked with the legal team um, to make sure that we had the appropriate permissions in place for these materials to become part of the collection. And something that was really important for me was I wanted scholars to be able to use these materials in their publications. And we know that that's such a complicated process. So we wanted to try to facilitate that as much as possible. Um, thinking about what formats different materials should be housed in and where physically in the library they should be stored um, to promote um, the most possible access and also to promote um, cross fertilization between different parts of the library collection. Um, building the actual digital platform. So there's a component of the collection that is a digital humanities uh, website, which I'll talk about in a minute. So we worked extensively with the, the digital um, collections team in the library. So lots of um, collaboration going on. Um, the cataloging and access. So cataloging is such a long um, process in libraries. It was something I had never really been familiar with before. And actually we're still in the process of cataloging a lot of the collection materials right now. Um, promotion and media donor cultivation, um, continuous knowledge dissemination, as well as continuous expansion, up updating of the collection, as well as outreach and education. So I'll talk about some of these key um, parts of the process today. So as I mentioned, one part of the collection that we created, um, I'll talk about each of the different parts, but one part that um, I personally was very closely involved with was the creation of the Pioneers of Chinese Dance Digital Archive. So this is a collection focused on private donations from individual dancers. So these were um, photographs scanned directly from the dancers' personal photo albums in their homes in China, and then um, cataloging these materials with English language metadata to make them accessible to researchers internationally. Um, uh, writing biographical narratives um, and descriptions and captions, um, using oral history interviews as the main process combined with archival research. And so the collection now is fully launched. We launched it in 2017, and it is available open access on the Digital Connections Library. If you just type in Pioneers of Chinese Dance, um, you will find it. And it is fully searchable. Um, you can search the full text of the captions if you're looking for a really specific image. You can also browse by topic. Um, and we have over 1,500 images in the database currently. So I'll give you an example of how um, this was constructed. So with one example, so one of the first uh, people I thought of um, who I thought would make a great contribution to this archive was a Mongol dancer, um, Sichin Tarar Ha, born in 1932 in Inner Mongolia. And this was someone that I had interacted with quite a bit during my field research. Initially, um, when I was doing my dissertation field work, I visited Kohat um, to attend a Mongolian dance festival and Sichin Tarar Ha was one of the judges. And then during the banquet dinners, um, I got to know her. She gave me a copy of her um, book, her memoir that she had published, and she was really open to um, having researchers be involved and document her work. And I um, have published a couple of uh, materials on her, especially this article in Faces of Tradition based on this oral history research. Um, but of course, the process of collecting the photographs from her was an entirely new stage of the research that was part of this collection process. So the first step was sort of going back to meet with her again in 2015 and to talk with her um, about why she might wanna do this and explain sort of what the collection would be, um, what the permissions would be and all of that. And she was very enthusiastic to participate so this is us in 2015. She signed all the forms and, you know, really um, wanted to donate her materials. So this is a page from the photo album that some of the photos came from. So the first step was to physically scan the photograph. So I basically carried a handheld um, scanner around to different dancers' homes to do this. Um, and then after that, the library had its own digitization process to make sure that the photographs could be <clears throat> um, easily searchable. We wanted, one of our goals was to make this collection something that when people Google, you know, a key term, that this is one of the collections that pops up um, pretty high up on the list. And so in order to do that, we paid a lot of attention to the way that the metadata and the images were processed. Um, the second stage after we physically scanned the photos was to actually collect the oral history that could help us understand what the photos um, were. So this is a, um, a photograph of me interviewing another um, dancer who contributed to the album. But just to give you a sense, it would just include them kind of explaining their life history, and then we would go through each photo and they would identify information about the photo um, that we could use in the metadata. Um, sometimes the physical photos themselves had um, writings on the back, like many of us did back in the day when we had uh, physical photographs. And so we would use that information as well um, to help with the metadata processing. We would also do um, cross-referencing to um, 
publications using digital archives to kind of identify if it was a specific dance work, for example, or a specific festival, um, we would search for that to make sure that the date and the location was correct. And Because sometimes with oral histories, as we know, um, people don't always rem remember things exactly um, in terms of dates and things like that. And so we wanted to get additional information and also cross-reference and verify that the information was um, accurate as much as we could, um, while also um, centering the oral history narrative as the source of the material ultimately. Um, of course, translating, um, because this was a primarily English database that did have some Chinese keywords, that was part of the process, like all the spreadsheets involved in that, um, and then actually writing the metadata. And so ultimately, this is um, these are two pages from Sitchin Taraha's portion of the collection. And like I said, it's open access, so if you're interested in exploring it further, I welcome you to do so. So we had 16 contributors. These are all prominent figures in Chinese dance history. As you can see, they're all... Um, relatively old. Um, that was part of our goal was we felt that this is a generation that, um, you know, is in their 80s and even 90s. And we want to document their lives and we want to document their art um, while we still can. In some cases, um, it was actually their children who passed on the materials on behalf of their parents. And so these are some just images from the collection. As you can see, they're quite wide ranging and diverse in terms of the types of dances that are represented. So up here we have um, a Chinese soldier dancing with a Tibetan um, in a circle dance. Um, here we have um, a, a Uyghur dancer um, performing a really famous piece. And we have modern dance from the 1930s and 40s. So it's a really wide range. So the Pioneers of Chinese Dance Digital Archive is just one part of the larger collection. So the collection also includes a very large um, range of rare print materials, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, we also have new um, multimedia materials that have been coming in over the last couple of years after people started to learn about the collection. One of those is the Audrey Muhang Young Collection, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then we also have um, a huge collection of secondary sources that um, circulate actually even through interlibrary loans. So they're very easily accessible. These are published materials um, in Chinese. Um, this is a sample of the rare print materials. So we have things like performance programs, which you can see on the bottom. We have things like dance manuals. So this is the very first Chinese classical dance manual that was published in 1960. Um, we have uh, dancers' photo albums. We have these little dance promotion cards that were about international dance styles. This is um, showing um, uh, Southeast Asian dance. We have um, training manuals that circulated in China, especially in the 1950s and 60s. Um, this is a dance game manual from the early 20th century. And then things like this, it's a mimeograph um, score for um, a, a, an amateur dance performance. So a really wide range of really interesting materials. Um, we also have um, archival documents from the founding meetings of the Chinese Dancers Association. So these are actually quite rare. They're actually handwritten meeting notes and other documents um, pertaining to China's National Dance Association. Um, and then for folklorists, I think of particular interest is there's a, a giant encyclopedia of Chinese folk dance where there's a volume um, for each province in China and they have really detailed descriptions of folklore performing arts and they also have a lot of illustrations and we have an original um, uh, manuscript pre publication manuscript that contains editorial notes um, uh, from that encyclopedia. Um, the Audrey Muhing Young Collection, this is an example of quite a few more recent donations that we've gotten when people have learned about the collection and sort of reached out to us when they have rare materials. So this is a really interesting one because Audrey Muhing Young was um, an Asian American, a Chinese American dancer who traveled to China in 1975 um, at the very end of the Cultural Revolution and brought with her um, a super eight millimeter film camera. And she recorded dances that she saw um, in China in 1975, as well as photograph slides um, and a, a diary sort of taking notes of the contents of each of the materials. Um, this is an example of the secondary source materials that we have. So um, all sorts of Chinese language publications about dance history, including ancient dance, modern dance, dance curricula, dance biographies, um, all sorts of different materials. Um, so in 2016, when the collection was sort of coming to fruition, um, Dr. Fu and I had the idea that we wanted to make it more accessible because having a collection is great, but if people don't know about it, then really there's almost no point in having it. So we had the idea to have a public facing exhibition, um, which was actually hosted in the library itself. So it would literally bring people to the gallery space of the library. And the collection was um, you know, widely publicized. So here you can see a sidewalk 
outside the University of Michigan. And we, we really, Liangi worked really, really carefully with a lot of different media groups. So we had like these banners and it was just kind of amazing to be walking around campus and see this um, Chinese dance being highlighted in that way. Um, and I also organized an international conference of scholars working on dance in East Asia from all over um, the North America, Europe and Asia um, to come to um, the University of Michigan while the um, while the gallery space was filled with the exhibit. And so it specifically targeted the scholarly community of people who are studying dance in East Asia to bring them to also learn more about the collection and also have a public event that could indicate the vibrancy of um, this field of scholarship at the time. So the collection itself, um, Liang Yu and I right now are actually working on a bilingual open access book that we're publishing on the basis of the exhibit because we want to make it open to people to use, for example, in, um, in teaching and education, um, as well as to use um, within China, and that's why it's bilingual. But I'll just go through the components of the exhibit really quickly. So the exhibit itself um, pulled out key materials from the collection in order to tell a story about the history of Chinese dance um, through specific themes. So we talked about the importance of reversing social hierarchies, which was central to socialist culture in general and was expressed in dance during this period, um, empowering women, um, dancing diversity, so the really strong presence of ethnic minorities within Chinese dance history, the really strong theme of anti-imperialism that ran through a lot of the dance performances um, in the mid-20th century. We talked about the creation process of contemporary folk dance that involves something that I term dynamic inheritance and sort of how that incorporates field research methods um, that choreographers actually do. Um, we featured individual um, artists who played at leading roles. A lot of them were people who had contributed to the pioneers of Chinese dance collection. Sort of, we wanted to get this beyond this idea of Chinese dance representing China and actually highlight the individual artists that are sometimes left out when we talk about folk uh, performance. We talked about um, dancers um, in the field and their research process, and we also talked about sort of dancers in China themselves popularizing dance through the media in various ways and public performances and things like that. Um, one of the things that's really well represented in the collection is the extensive um, exchange that happened between China and other parts of the world during the 20th century. So we have um, a large section looking at performing um, different world dance forms in China, as well as Chinese dances circulation abroad um, and foreign dance tours, because we have a large number of performance programs in the collection from international companies touring in China. And so the collection documents not only Chinese dance, but also international dance that was um, performed in China during this period. And the exhibition focused specifically on the period from 1945 to 1965. Um, we also wanted to have more tactile components. So we had some physical programs on display. Um, I had a lot of dance props that I, that show different ways that Chinese dance um, is performed with these physical objects. So we had this collection just on display and then um, a collection of further research of other materials in the collection. We also had videos because of course dance is such a um, audiovisual form. We wanted people to see the dance in action. Um, and then we did a lot of work, as I said, to make sure there was good promotion of the event. Um, we also got quite a bit of coverage in the Chinese language press, um, not only English, but also Chinese. So actually we started to get interest from other people in China who learned about our um, collection and wanted to contribute to it. We continue to do outreach such as library donor events. Um, Liang Yu presented on the collection at the Dance Studies Association Conference in 2019, again, to attract researchers to the collection. Um, we did a cool project with a local Detroit-based artist um, that was focused on um, representing different collections from the University of Michigan Library through um, community-engaged art. And so one of our um, images, this image of the Uyghur dancer Kambara Han that I showed earlier was selected um, to be featured in this art um, exhibit, which also also brought different community members um, because the community members actually painted um, each of these through this pixel technique. And then we also have um, a postdoctoral fellow, Anne Rebel, who has been creating a finding aid for our most recent batch of programs. And um, so we had a story that featured a program that she found of um, a, a really important dance, um, or excuse me, an important music performance in China. And so one of the things that's happened is although the collection initially focused on dance, um, a lot of the materials, of course, dance is very closely related to music and theater and other forms. So the music has expanded, or the, the collection has expanded to include um, music programs and theater programs as well. And that's what the story talks about. 
So we've continued to expand the collection. Um, we are continuing to think of new ways to increase access and digitization. Um, we really work um, extensively on collaborations with scholars. So currently we're planning um, with Lan Lan Kuang, the organizer of this event, um, to host an NEH Summer Institute, um, ideally in 2023. Um, we'll be putting in the application next year. So if it's successful, um, we hope to have a summer institute where scholars can come to the collection and um, do research um, under our guidance. And we're also continuously thinking of ways to teach the material. So if anyone's interested in hosting the exhibit that I talked about at your, your museum or your school, um, you can reach out to us and we'd be very interested in talking more. So the, there are plenty of resources if you'd like to learn more about the collection here. And also, um, I can't not do a plug for my book, which actually... Um, benefited a lot from the collection materials. So a lot of the collection materials are analyzed um, in the book and basically it provides a history of dance in China that closely connects to the, to the contents of the collection. We also have um, travel grants available for scholars who wanna visit the library to use the non-circulating rare materials in the collection. And that provides funding for scholars to come to spend a couple of days or even a week on campus um, using the library collection materials. So thank you so much. And if you'd like to learn more, please feel free to reach out to us. So these are email addresses and we're very willing um, to work with you to help you uh, research Chinese dance on the basis of this collection. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Emily. That was wonderful. I believe that's like a fresh, well, to me, still a fresh breath of air where it shows our audience and um, students how dynamic um, a library, a new collection, the scope and um, depth and uh, how far reaching it can be both locally right, and beyond um, borders. So this is wonderful. And a good news is Dr. Fu is also here with us today, but um, so, but we are on time schedule. So I will be ushering everyone um, to go to the Zoom session where you can ask Dr. Uh, Wilcox and also Dr. Fu in person virtually um, questions about the presentation, the collection, or anything that is related to ethnographic research on dance, theater, um, multimedia. It, it, it is really a multifaceted, multidisciplined field uh, when we think in terms of dance research and also ethnomusicology, right? Um, that, that's our background and how we are connected to each other. So. Um...